Hi, I'm Chloe Canning. Welcome back for season two on Loop of Courage. Luminate Leadership acknowledges the traditional Estonians of the land, which we were called this podcast, the Yugur and Terrible People. We pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to Lead with Courage, the podcast that celebrates the bold and inspiring stories of leaders making a difference. We're your hosts, Andy and Shui Canning, and together we'll dive into the minds of the trailblazers, the risk takers, and those who embrace life with a growth mindset. Welcome back to the Lead with Courage podcast. Today, I'm so excited to welcome our guest, the founder, CEO, and self-confessed chief troublemaker of the Somewhere Co, Ellen Powell. We're so excited for this conversation where we're going to speak to Ellen around launching her own business in 2020 following her long-standing career, what the Somewhere Co stands for, how do they build the community and the culture that they have there, and also some of the personal lessons for her as a founder. Strap in, get ready for a live, bold, colourful, exciting conversation. Welcome, Ellen Powell. Let's go. Woo. Ellen, welcome to the Lead with Courage podcast. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Now, off air, I might have just discovered, is this your first official podcast? My first podcast. I'm feeling very honoured. I'm sure you've been asked to a lot of podcasts before, but I'm very honoured that you're here. Thank you. Anything for you. Oh, <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm really excited to get into this conversation with you. Your business is one I've seen and a lot of people have seen over the years and it always just makes me smile. The, the boldness, the bright, the colour just makes me so happy and when I sit with you and every time I've ever spoken with you, I can see that is that is absolutely shining through and just emulated from you. So I'm, yeah, really thrilled to share you with the world and the Lead to Courage um, listeners. So thank you again. I'm excited. Um, we always kick off with one question, which is to ask our guests, what does Lead with Courage mean to you? For me, it is leading with authenticity, which really ties into a lot of the brand values and living boldly. So I need to practice what I preach. So being really authentic, not everyone is perfect um, and really concentrating on personal growth and then helping everyone else on that journey as well. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. I love the authenticity. And we get so caught up in, I think, sometimes people trying to be other people or trying to be like other people and it's that... We can be inspired by them, but we don't need to emulate someone else. Like, just be you. Exactly. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, tell us a little bit about who you are then. Um, I'd love to get into the business journey, but a little bit of a background that what's brought you to becoming the founder of the Somewhere Co. and its other brands. Yes. Well... I grew up in regional Queensland, um, ended up in Gladstone, I think, when I was in grade two, and um, have come from nothing, essentially. was living in housing commission um, and everything, I guess, throughout my career, I've had to kind of get there on my own. Mm. Um, So, went to uni, always was a creative person through school and was pretty driven knew that I wanted to do some kind of art or design so went to uni and studied visual communication design Um, actually didn't get into that first uh, because it was such a closed I think you need an OP for those that remember OPs of two oh Um, wow that's super yeah to get into this degree and I did not get a two I was not going to study medicine so you know that was that um so I got into advertising. So I actually studied advertising first and then moved over to my design degree, which was really heavily marketing. So I think um, those two things alone, you know, have built up my resilience and grit um, as well as my education of what was to come next. Yeah. And, you know, I landed myself in some amazing careers. So went into publishing, went into a PR agency and was creative director um, was that, I was looking at your uh, history. Was that Fleur Madden's business? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. The connection. She's also been on this podcast. Yeah. yeah. Love Fleur. Fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, I think I went to work with Fleur. Uh, I'd just come back from overseas. So I'd lived overseas and had my very much Devil's Wears Prada um, publishing moment, <laughs> uh, which was just amazing and um, was working with some of the biggest brands in the world and um, – yeah, was in the creative division there, so 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 amazing. Yeah, and then come back to Australia and went to work for, for Fleur, 
uh, and had just gotten married in that time as well Mm -hmm. and um, missed that publishing side. So I started doing wedding invitations for friends Um, and then from there I got a little bit bored and needed to turn them into products. Don't ask me why, I just started making prints and then um, managed to start wholesaling them in a couple of stores, just like the local store actually down the road here. Oh, wow. Um, a florist and then moved to greeting cards. So it's been a bit of a journey from, you know, small hometown. Yeah. Uni, amazing career and getting married and then here I am running this stationary brand by accident. Yeah, um, wow. But a part of the reason I did start it as well was – you know, I'd gotten married. I was very young. I think I was 23 at the time. And you and I might have connected over this yes, in the past. <laughs> yes. And uh, was, what do you do next after you get married? You're from mm. a small town. You get married. You have kids. Mm. So, you know, that has been ingrained in me. And not that I was ready for kids, but I knew I'm such a planner. I'm always like a year, two years, five years um, ahead in my brain. So I started planning and thinking, oh gosh, how am I having this amazing career and having my family and having it all Mm. at that time? This is like over 10 years ago now. And decided, okay, well, I do need to do something to have that flexibility, you know, if I can't work full time. So um, classic business story. I feel like when people have kids and they're like, I'll go start my business. I was planning before that. The business before the kids. I love (laughs) that. So... Uh, that's when the business, that's, that, I guess that's my why. I really wanted that flexibility and that ab- ability to have it all mm. um, as a woman as well. I feel like there's, you know, the guy gets to go back to work two weeks. Why can't a woman? There was definitely mm. a lot. There's been a lot of shifts over the last 10 years, of course. But, uh, yeah, that was very much my why as to why I started the business. So that's how I started. And that was the confetti Yes, that's blushing confetti. Blushing confetti. Blushing confetti. Yeah. And then talk us then how, because when I look at the background, the Somewhere Co launching in 2020, if I've got that right. Yeah. And now as a fellow founder of a business who launched in 2020, most people are going to look at us and go, why the hell would you launch a new (laughs) business in the middle of COVID? Can you talk us through what the transition was there? Yes. So this had been, I guess, in the wind for a little while. So Mm -hmm. Blushing Confetti had moved from just being stationary into work products, so diaries, journals, and then we just started entering um, into lunch bags because Mm. they were going in with everything. Uh, And so our product range was expanding. We were very much wholesale still at the time. um, And 2020 rolled around there was already a lot of change in the business and we actually had another business by that time really randomly baby bags and baby products like change mats etc was this you planning for your future no, what bag would I like this was me um this is when my now partner arrived on the scene and we decided to make this other beautiful business which was was really hard actually to do two at the same time um so we hired our first employees at this Mm -hmm. time so uh, this is when Kate joined amazing Uh, you know she was at Mecca and um the same same thing couldn't really go back to work at the time I'm sure Mecca's changed now but Mm. very little flexibility I said come work for me um had you been friends before had yes yeah okay you'd known each other yeah so yeah we've known each other since we're 18 wow um so for those listening Kate is still in the business it's been six years now and um came in early early days and she's now had all the roles all the hats um literally (laughs) yes and all the lunch bags and all the lunch bags (laughs) yes Um, and it's also a mum to kids who go to school with my daughter so it's a very small world (laughs) very very connected little world um but then so we had these two brands we had this product expansion happening and I was thinking, oh, this is getting too hard with two systems. The Mm. customers were essentially the same. Um, We're doing double the work with not the same reward. So had been thinking about it, had started thinking of what it could look like, brand names, et cetera. We were moving office. We had this intense renovation, um, which you've seen. Yes. um, Of our beautiful office. And then COVID was starting to happen right. and I've gone well I've got the time now it's like the slate had been cleared uh, for the brain yes. and I've gone well let's do it the world's a little quiet 
um, in this crazy time, it's time. So just hit go. I had a very clear vision because I've been thinking about it for so long. And yeah, so eventually the brand, I think it took um, six months to pull it all together between the website and all our fun videos and logos, etc. Um, and then launched it to the world and never looked back. It's, it was insane. That's incredible. So tell us a little bit about the Somewhere Co. Maybe the name, what the name stands for. And for those who might not be as familiar with the brand, which would be a f- only a small few people, um, <laughs> but a little bit of about the brand and, and what you guys do now. Yep. So obviously starting with the um, lunch bags and we had by that point also brought in picnic rugs. Mm. Um, It was all products to take you somewhere. And um, when we started the brand, it was very much going somewhere with you in your life because we had that motherhood aspect um, as well. So we had all these themes of going somewhere, whether it was outside to work in motherhood, the journey that that is. Um, So this is where this word somewhere came from. Uh, so evolving that and really refining that um, and now it's very much ingrained of obviously who we are and it drives a lot of um, product decisions um, because we want to go somewhere with you. So wherever you're going somewhere, um, aside from camping gear, um, <laughs> Is that unless, on it's, the aesthetic, horizon? unless no. it's super aesthetic, <laughs> uh, you know, we're designing products that you can take on the go um, with you and it means something as well. We don't want to just make something for the sake of making something. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So can you tell us where the business is now, you know, four years down the track? Four years, it has been the craziest of all crazy roller coasters um, that I'm still on. <laughs> and what, what part of the roller coaster are we feeling right now? Sometimes we're at the top, are you on the, on the build back up, maybe down that bottom bit or on an upside down loop? <laughs> <laughs> Almost like an upside down <laughs> loop. Um, but no, building, I'd say we're going up to the next phase. Beautiful. Um, so it's been four years. We have grown from, I think, from when we had um, the rebrand. We had three, including me, team members. Mm-hmm. Um, now across the business we have 40 team members. Wow. And we've developed, we've got three stores in Brisbane, Melbourne, um, Perth. We have this humongous warehouse now, which is always baffling to me every time I walk into it. Um, And so, so, so many new products and this beautiful community as well that we've been building. So the business has just completely changed, I'd say, from the get-go. But it's been really exciting to build and, you know, build this community both internally and externally. Um, And, yeah, we're just at our next phase of, growth and change I'd say yeah beautiful beautiful and the community is actually something I do want to speak with you about because people can bring product out but what's the difference between a really powerful brand I think is the con- the emotional connection or the connection to the brand and creating that community can you tell us a little bit around how you built the community and I suppose maybe the values of the somewhere co that really connect with the community and why why maybe people have just become such raving fans the product but also the brand yeah I think it it very much starts with us just getting on camera you know Mm. Kate and I in the early early days of getting on and going through the baby bags and going through you know the challenges of what you're facing in life and how this um the product is a byproduct I guess of what we were talking about but um you know how to move through life more seamlessly and so we developed started developing that connection and we still have our OG blushing confetti um community I love when I hear that and they're like I've been around since OG days oh it's so awesome um you know so they're used to us getting on camera and that has evolved over time but definitely that's how it started and then the team as we've grown have also done um more of that as well and just being showing up as that authentic real human we make mistakes we can be really funny humor is a huge part of what we do as well we don't take ourselves too seriously so feel like we can connect with our community a bit um easier because we're just real humans and we're just wanting to have a chat essentially like if you you're in a room with us we love a good chat. Um, <laughs> I have been in the rooms with you and there is a good chat always, always, so, no matter who's in the room. Yeah. yeah. So I'd say it starts from there and then we've just strengthened that as we've gone and uh, gone on. 
And yes, developed our values. So our values have gone through two sets of changes mm-hmm. um, since we started. They were really important. That was a part of the rebrand, I think, you know, six months after we actually launched the, you know, the logos and all the pretty stuff. We started really working on the values because our team was expanding so quickly. And they were good, um, but they were very much internal. So, you know, authenticity, as I mentioned, mm. is really important to me. Um, so that was clearly a value. Yes. Uh, and, you know, we broke down those supporting and non-supporting behaviours and it was great internally to know, you know, this is what we're about. When you come into this business, this is who we are and this is who we kind of expect you, how do you just show up as well into the business. Um, but we did a bit of a rejig of them, gosh, a year ago, mm-hmm. just over a year ago, and may turn them into outward-facing ones as well. So they were internal but also external so mm. that – our community knew what we stood for uh, so every single decision made sense as yes. to what they were seeing and or how we're speaking um you know for example you can sit with us which means you know creating a diverse community and that's just not internal that's also the the things that we get behind and mm. you know we see hate on social media for certain things of certain you know people we employ in our stores or um, people that just have too much time on their hands for hate in the world, essentially. Mm, mm. Um, so it's really important that we solidify who we are, what we're about, so that when, you know, we do get any negativity coming into the business, we're like, well, this is who we are. You don't have to like it. This is a safe place for us. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's just one example. Um, you know, there's definitely – you can see some brands when they don't have their values really clearly aligned to – their operations, mm. um, it can come across as what's the word? Oh, just like, tokenistic, like yeah, yeah. And yeah. whereas we genuinely mean what we're saying. Um, what are some examples? Because I love, uh, I love that one. It actually really stands out for me when I've been in your office and I've seen the frames and I've seen the beautiful pictures, but. I, I also believe it's not tokenistic, like it's not yep. just the words on the wall. Yep. Are there some examples, not necessarily the hate, but it may be some of the ones where you've boldly gone out and, um, yep. I mean, the hate too, but I, I'm, I'm not here to, to uh, amplify or give those no. people the time for their voice. But I guess some of the things you've done that you're proud of from the brand yeah. that aligns to that. Um, yeah, I guess it's positivity across some of these things as well, but um, – when we say you can sit with us, it means everyone can sit with us. You know, if you're being an asshole, maybe maybe not you. You can sit that <laughs> out for a little while. Fair, fair. Um, yeah. but you we come back when you've had a think about yeah, your behaviour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we will – our transgender community, we, mm-hmm. we love everyone and we'll always have a chat, as you know, and there's – I don't know, but it's just, it is what it is. The world is not black and white and yeah. we have, we're a colourful world. There is no one way of doing things. And so our team, there is no, we do not hire one kind of person essentially. And yet yeah, I will bring up a recent scenario. We did have um, someone in one of our stores um, doing a really cute video uh, of the lunch they were packing. Mm-hmm. Now this person might not dress the same way as everyone else, might not appear the same way as, well, who is everyone else, right? Who Who is actually saying that? Right. And the level of, oh, I can't believe the Somewhere Co supports this and, um, you know, just the disgust in some of these comments, it was wild to me. I was horrified that uh, people actually think they can say these things. Um, but, yes, we do support you know, inclusivity mm. um, and diversity. So, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Take your comments elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and how did, I mean, it, it blows my mind as well. One, you know, we can all have, we're all entitled to our own beliefs, but I believe sprouting hate and, yeah, I, I, I just know no time for it and it baffles me that people find time and space in their day that that's how they actually want to express themselves. It yeah. It from a curiosity perspective, I go, wow, what's really going on for that person that they feel that that's yeah. okay. That's but that's not okay for the other people receiving it. So, how did you guys respond as a brand? Um, a mixture of, you know, we actually our customers were great. So they know our 
our brand yeah, essentially. Be, because externally you're always sharing what yeah. you stand for. Yeah. And I loved this. A customer jumped on some of these comments like before we even got to them and just using humour a little bit mm-hmm. in just – and all like she came back and said – didn't even concentrate on what that person was saying so much about that person. It was like, oh, um, what – do you not want your lunch in, in a lunchbox or something? You know, yeah, just like, yes. duh, I can't even believe that this is a thing, so I'm going to ignore this. And so there's an element of that approach as well coming in through our customers. Um, we do not encourage hate, so we we do shut down anything that's coming going too aggressive or anything mm, like that. Yeah. Um, but we end up just responding saying we're an inclusive community and, you know, maybe this isn't the space for you. Yeah. Um, but that's just one example of our values. I feel like it just – the importance of values is really highlighting what you are and what you aren't about. Yes. And, you know, it that was – that one example is crazy. Obviously, we've had more and the bigger your business grows, the more that happens. But a business that stands for nothing – What's the saying? The business is stands for nothing. I think Katy Perry says falls for everything. Well, yeah. <laughs> is, it, is that it? Yeah. There's like a Katy Perry line, which I'm sure is not just a Katy Perry line. But I think, yeah, when you stand for nothing, you fall for everything. Yeah. But also you don't stand for anything, right, either. Yes. Like who yeah. who are you if you're not on either side? Yeah. yeah. So that just plays into, I guess, us and living boldly and living authentically. Um, so that's just one example of the – how values really impact your business. I think it's a, it's a great one and I, I really believe that to have the courage and the confidence to stand up for who for who we are, what we stand for and then those people in that community feel safe and they yes. feel seen and they feel that they belong, which is an incredible human need, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. But we have lots of positive ones as well. So we our values are colour outside a line. So it's, you know, being creative, Um and moving the needle. So we're not just at work to have all this fun, which you might see on social media. We do move the needle and we are growing the business. Um, and now one of our other ones is find the better way. Yeah. So we're always looking for better ways to do things. Basically, we're really expansive in our mindset. Growth mindset is huge, um, which is why we get people like you to come into our office and um, educate and nurture our team into growing. So, yeah, I'd say those values are really ingrained in the business makeup and what we are all about. I, I love it. And it is to me as a customer or someone in, in communities where you choose what brands you want to align yourself with or purchase from, it is so important. And I, I just think when brands are clear on who they are, they put it out there with confidence and pride and it, it's – yeah, then you can choose if yep. is it, am I aligned here or, or not. Uh, but I love that. I love having a, a clear – concise way of this is who we are you know come and join us and yeah it's powerful yeah powerful can I ask from um, a perspective of being a founder and what I was going to say and a female founder but then I'm just jumping into my own um, it challenges here but as a female founder and as a founder full stop have you had any pushback or negativity around I guess, being so bold and um, standing up for things you believe so strongly where some people might go, oh, you might be limiting who follows you or um, comes on the journey or who's a customer, you need to be broader. Have Mm. you ever had that kind of feedback or pushback? Oh, I feel like you have micro bits of it along the way. Mm. Um, But I'm all about protecting the vision. So those things are just water off a duck's back. I'm yeah. barely listening, but 100% along the way people will be like, oh, have you tried this or maybe you do this? And, yeah, I just don't pay too much attention to it essentially. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, I think it's super important as a female founder, We can, as women, we definitely can get into um, traps of, remember, let's go back, I was from regional Queensland. I had this mindset of like, this is how life goes. Mm. So you have to unlearn a lot of your behavioural things that you've been taught. And yes. women are sometimes the worst enemy, not only with each other, mm. um, because I'd say a lot of, you know, the women in business thing, I haven't really had any men try hold me back or, you know, say, oh, you're just a woman. Definitely... Um, a few occasions and a few like bigger boardrooms and things, but that has evolved. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you show up and you know your stuff, no one cares if you're a woman. Mm. Um, sex doesn't mean anything, I think, too much anymore. It depends on the scenario. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, women can be their worst enemy, I would say, in their business journey. Your own personal worst enemy or to other women? I think or both. Or a bit of both, yeah. A bit of both. Mm. Um, women should really be championing each other, lifting each other up. Um, and sometimes I feel like, depending on where you're at in the journey, women want to tear each other down. And it's like, we've already got too much shit to deal with. Yeah. No one has time for that. What's that Madeleine Albright quote? I think it's, um, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. Yeah. Uh, but I think that that's come because it isn't always seen, which it again blows my mind. I just yeah. think that, but uh, is that not a um, having a growth mindset, but also just an abundance mindset of yeah. there's enough space for us all to do yeah. well? I, I really believe that. Even when people are in similar fields or similar industries, it's like there is enough space. There are enough people out there that we can all succeed in our yeah. own way just do it differently do yeah. your own spin you know you shouldn't be going back to that authenticity piece don't be trying to be someone else as well you know mm. um but yeah but also internally definitely we hold ourselves back um and yeah. we doubt ourselves too much and yeah I, f- I find that men just go after a little bit more what they're looking for whereas we sometimes will hold ourselves back to a different standard and go oh you know we can't do that of course you can fucking do that yes yes <laughs> yes you can <laughs> what have you done you said before around the growth mindset and really developing yourselves and I know that's really important to you personally what kind of things have you done to get your own mindset like have you you said before you have to un have to have unlearned some of those yeah. um, patterns or conditioning that you might have had growing up so yeah. how have you gone about those things and what have you done for yourself over the years Definitely, I got myself a business coach yeah, great. Um, during COVID and um, that, I think I saw her for about two years mm-hmm. and that was really enlightening. So, you know, it's so important to do your disc assessments and do all these assessments around yourself to see what your strengths and weaknesses and so you can grow them and evolve over time. Yes. I had no experience leading a team of, at that time, you know, we were getting 20 people. So... That's a shock to the system. You're going yeah. from three, which is a bit more like, oh, yeah, let's get in and get it done. And people you've known too, right? So there's already that trust and understanding of how you operate potentially. Yes. Um, but then all of a sudden you've got to become the leader. Like you are the visionary. You are the person that is taking everyone on the journey and you need to know what you're doing somewhat. Like no one really knows what they're doing. You're totally faking it a lot of the way. But you still need to show up for other people to mm-hmm. so they know where they're going as well. So um, the leadership coaching was fantastic going through um, my – it wasn't just me and work. It was me personally. It was yeah. my life essentially. So yes. I'm like, are you just a leadership coach or really are you my um, psychologist? Yeah, I don't know yeah. right now. Exactly. Um, but, yes, yeah, so I think that was a really crucial piece. And then um, reading a million books, mm-hmm. listening to a million podcasts um, – you know, little things you might notice in conversations. You go, oh, I didn't really feel right there. I think that's the biggest key. When you can feel within yourself that you've had a conversation with someone and you knew you could do better, mm. that's when you go and figure out what what is it that you needed to learn in that moment and how do you make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. So I think it's that self-learning really because it doesn't just stop with a, a coach. You keep going. You yes. read the books you need to read. You listen to those podcasts and, yeah, you just feel within yourself whether you're happy with the person that you are and the feedback you're getting. Like mm. I think it's so important to get feedback from other people and make sure that it's a two-way street so that yeah. your team or whoever it might be feels safe enough to go – I didn't feel safe in that moment or this didn't align with me. Um, And then you make your judgment then of the role you played in that. Yes, yes. There's a couple of – I've got a couple of questions I'd love to dig in. Um, The books, are there any that stand out that are really like you're, you know, on the bookshelf in your office? Yeah, well, I've got a lot in my um, office. (laughs) Um, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team Mm. was really – uh, that was at that crucial time and... I think that actually is right behind me as we speak. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm trying to look for it now. Yeah. It mm. is a very, very good book. Um, and just the core basics essentially, you know, that was a time where I was like, I'm nailing it when I read that book. This was great. But your business grows through waves and so that book has really been a um, guiding light with anyone we've brought in that needed mm. to maybe upskill some of their leadership skills. So that book in particular for me was 
a big one. Yeah, it's great. Um, Patrick the, Lencioni, if yes. people want to look it up. Yeah. Yes, I'm terrible with uh, names, so I'm glad that you... Well, yeah, no, I'll, I'll try and throw them in. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other one that uh, I have loved from a different perspective is the Zappos founder. Mm. Um, God, what, what's his book called now? Uh, yes, um, Tony Shea yes. and is Delivering Happiness. Delivering Happiness. Mm. So that book is a mixture of values, really, really strong value work. Uh, you know, they were, for example, that's it. Um, that's it. There it is, yeah. They were, you know, giving employees that didn't quite fit the business monetary rewards to lead the business because they just weren't in alignment so I Mm. think that book is primarily yes it's around doing everything for the customer but also the value work in that was really Mm. eye-opening to me Um, so I'd say those two books have been my highlights yeah Um, but I read a lot as well but those two I love those two I absolutely love those two how do you find the time to read is is it audio books is it sitting down Oh, God, I go through seasons where I will read a lot and mm-hmm. then, you know, coming into Q4, maybe not. Um, but I definitely need a physical book. Yeah. So I'll listen to podcasts, um, you know, on a walk, an hour podcast. Um, but, yeah, physical book. And then when I'm not reading, trying to listen to – plus also coaching. So I didn't even mention I'm in a million different coaching um, things. Programs. Yes. And, yeah. So I'm forever upskilling – and listening to other people's stories mm. and, you know, workshopping the business, etc. So I have sessions every single day. Um, but yes, so I, I'm full of knowledge constantly. Yes, I love that. And then, you know, running it through, I imagine it's running through the filter. Okay, what can I take from this person's yeah. story? What can I take? What's aligning with me? Maybe there's things in the past, you go, well, we were doing that really well, but now we've grown, we need to come back to those roots yes. or yeah. we haven't tried that yet because we haven't been at that size yet. So now now it's time to give that a go. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Beautiful. So I love, I love hearing, Ellen, I love hearing about the books and the podcasts and prioritising that. And I think it's a huge, huge part of leadership that we invest back in ourselves, in our, in our time, financially, whatever it may be, but to keep growing ourselves because I think that then – permeates through the whole culture and one thing I've really noticed I think one on socials and you know you see a version of that but also behind the scenes when I've worked with your team and met your team there's just this really genuine culture there and there's um, a culture that from I would describe is is such an empathic connected culture what are your thoughts on that and and is that how you would describe the culture you think it's a fair assessment but how do you create that environment I think it comes from you again um you are that leader and you and then there's the level underneath you of leadership that everyone needs to be on the same page as to what is expected which is where the values also Mm. come in uh i am naturally quite an empathetic person um and you know sometimes to my detriment but you can't help what you are and i think that is a big lesson for me um that i teach the team around empathy and kindness which is why it is weaved into our values um but growth mindset and emotional intelligence all those things are so so crucial because that's where people can be kind to someone else and not maybe not take something personally if something's going on or someone's having a bad day Mm. um and more coming from an empathetic place instead of a defensive place Mm. so i think it's all weaved into one thing which is knowing yourself understanding yourself because you can only control yourself and your emotions. Um, but yes, bringing in a team and levelling up the team to have that emotional intelligence is really key in the culture. Yes, absolutely. And so when you're hiring people, how do you hire for that? Uh, it's funny, We I sat down with um, one of our employees yesterday and I had just made a comment like, oh, I think everyone has to go through quite a lot of interviews and a personality test. I'm a Scorpio, so I want to know everyone's life story. I think think that's actually really important. I do understand the person when they're coming in, what not only what motivates them, um, but also you know what they've gone through to get to where they are in their career. Uh, so yeah, interviews are normally quite deep. I'm sorry for anyone who has had an interview with me. <laughs> um, not all stages. There's a certain stage where we get into that. Um, but yeah, also that th- those tests and the personality tests, and mm. then making sure that someone else in the team meets them. 
um, to make sure that they're the right fit in the business. So I, I have learned to not take that lightly. You know, early in the early days, yes. we'd be like, oh, you're friends with such and such, such, and such or uh, Facebook mark, not Facebook marketplace, Facebook groups, uh, you know, oh, you're local, you do some marketing, cool. You know, that's something so much smaller now as we've been growing and even um, you're learning constantly and, you know, we've had a few lessons along the years, including this year, so it just gets more refined mm. who and how you let people into the business because it's so crucial to get the right people on the bus. So crucial. Absolutely everything, isn't it? Especially as you grow, um, you go from that place of being in control when it's such a small business, but then when you get larger, you're in a place of influence. So you're not yeah. there for every decision and every movement. So, yeah, it's critical. It's mm. critical. One of the things um, that – really sparked a thought from before that you mentioned was around feedback. Uh, Actually, the last podcast we did on Lead With Courage was around feedback and Mandy and I were talking about the importance of feedback, how we ask for feedback, how we get feedback. And you mentioned that, you know, asking for feedback is really important in creating the safe space. Practically, how do you ask? Who do you ask and how do you ask for feedback? Oh, gosh, I don't know if I'm very good at necessarily asking for Mm -hmm. feedback, feedback, but in, we create an environment where feedback is it, its just a part of our value system. So I will constantly get feedback from my leadership team as to think things a different way or um, approach things a different way. Or I will – no, that's a lie. I actually do ask for feedback. I will go and ask how can I approach this differently or because I've already gone in one way, or what do you think? And, you know, I'll take on the thoughts of someone else in yeah. those moments for sure. And then in a, you know, one-on-one with a meeting sense across the whole business, feedback is, is ingrained in our values. There's no, we don't want anyone to be holding back. We want people to say how they're feeling. Mm. Um, so, yes, I think we can probably get better in asking and saying, how do you, f-? well, we do say how do you feel, and but maybe have I made you feel a certain way? is probably something we can improve. Yeah, okay. But feedback is more of a natural part of yeah. who we, like we are. I think it comes with that emotional intelligence but definitely can be refined. Well, I mean, if I can give feedback on the feedback, <laughs> I feel if you're saying it's just a natural, then it is so naturally in, intentionally embedded, which from what I observe in a lot of businesses isn't there naturally. Yeah. So whatever it is that you're doing that creates people just that they're throwing feedback around as the norm, it's safe and that's really effective because I think sometimes we can overdo the feedback that it needs to be this big event and, you know, this big meeting to have the feedback, but it doesn't need to be, right? Like I think you actually want it just to be a constant exchange and it makes sense when you go back to the five dysfunctions, doesn't it? Because the second layer in the five dysfunctions is around conflict and healthy conflict. Yes. And But first is trust, which then when you've explained your interview process and how deep you go with people, like, like, yep, tick, tick, you know, so it all makes absolute sense. Yeah, that's brilliant. And in a performance review, even I'm just thinking now you're unpacking this, I'm Mm. like, hmm. You know, it's definitely not a one-way street even in that moment Mm. where, you know, it's meant to be that person – you know, we're going through their performance, which sometimes be quite daunting, but they're not meant to be daunting. They're meant to be, if you've had your check-ins with someone along the way, there should be no surprises when you come to a performance review. And I find a lot of those reviews that everyone has always been comfortable to come back and say, hey, this is what I've needed, or this wasn't, this didn't sit right with me or whatever it might be. But again, if you've had the check-ins and you've already had that two-way conversation, there's less of that. So yeah, yeah, I feel like most people feel really heard in in the business. I don't want to speak for them. Uh, but, yeah, I do think it's a natural two-way street in whatever we're doing. But definitely can go, how has this made you feel, I guess? But, mm. no, I think it's ingrained. Which is just magic. The more businesses that can have that ingrained, I truly passionately believe the better results will be because other people have got great ideas and they've got different ways of seeing things and as a founder or as a leader we can't have all the answers we're not expected to have all the answers you're not in every room in every conversation so you want to rely on those true trustful voices and people throwing curveballs or different things you're like ah 
oh, what a gift, like to then Mm. go, well, how do we grow? But, yeah, that's your openness. That really is about you wanting to grow and be better and move the needle. That is 100% what you will have created, uh, which is so powerful. So, so good. So good. So if we come back, I'm really – I want to pick up this conversation that in your first business, um, the baby bags and planning for your – when you were going to have a baby. And right now as we sit here today – Um, That business has then evolved, but we keep – I want to come back to how did that plan go? And, (laughs) you know, I saw a social media post from you recently freezing some eggs. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a very personal conversation, but we we have decided and and spoken before we came on air that was a a public post and we'll um, maybe just – delve into that a little bit because 10 years ago you were you know planning this exit <laughs> uh, for when you went and had your babies and I now it was 12 years now. 12 years yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and now, fill us in <laughs> my gosh uh again it comes back to i think unlearning and mm. um some of that conditioning and because the fact is i actually wasn't ready to have kids at that age mm. and even now you know the business is in such a peak time it's not there's no good time to have kids but there's so much pressure especially once you hit 30 yes you know you've got your doctor going into the doctors and like well you should start thinking about having kids now and it's gone I still feel like I'm a teenager uh but I'm also building something and yes so I think it's taking back some of that control and trying to not listen to that societal societal pressure yeah which comes at us um i am 35 this year and you know whilst kids are definitely a current discussion not quite ready so Mm. decided to freeze my eggs i'm going in for another round because yes your eggs do decrease as you get older naturally um and there's gonna be a point you know where i do have to have kids but you know you can have kids in your 40s there's Mm. there is just so much pressure to have kids and it really you need to stay in the game. You need your head clear. You need to not worry about whatever happens, happens. Yes. So, yes, went and froze my eggs and documented a little bit of the um, story because it's just so daunting for people and it can be expensive, um, but there are payment options. And I think we put this wall up and um, of making things harder than what they are. Yeah. Um, it's the same with... I'm big on property and I'm like likening properties to babies. But um, (laughs) again, as women, buying your own property, it is so important, I think, to Mm. have your own financial independence. That is a really, really important thing to me. And that process is made so daunting and we're kind of like, oh, no, we can't do that. We need to do it with a partner or Mm. whatever the excuses are. I find the same thing with egg freezing. We, We put barriers in place that you just go do it. It's it's no you don't need anyone else to do this. This is for you. This is for your future. Mm. And I find egg freezing very much in the same, you know, realm as doing that. So yeah, took it took it upon myself, took that control, um, and decided to go freeze those eggs for when I'm ready. But yeah, I'm a woman in business. Like I need time. Yes. I love that you shared that. I love you sharing it with me now. I remember when I had Chloe, I was 35 and that was classed as a geriatric pregnancy and I was floored, 35. Like I, you know, I feel so young. Well, I'm not in my 30s anymore but, um, you know, I don't feel old and yes. it's that pressure that we've put on from society, it's it's immense. And then almost the shame, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on this but that's what I loved about you sharing it because just – making it a normal conversation. A normal conversation. Like this is, I mean, it may not be everyone's scenario, but yes. let's talk about things like I had a miscarriage before Chloe and then having I've had a hysterectomy in the last 18 months, uh, talking about endometriosis and different things. Like these conversations are, they're not everyone's interest, but at the same time I think they've been kept behind so many doors, locked behind so many doors because of shame and yes. embarrassment, which but they're, they're just actually... Life. that people are going through in life yes. so the more we open the door to it go hey here if you need if you want to chat about this one um because there ha- there can be hard things for people to navigate because of the shame previously attached what are your thoughts on all that 
oh my God, yes, I'm sitting here going, yes, yes, people, please stop. It is just so, this is life. This is what, you know, women go through all of this and definitely there's so much shame associated. Um, When I started posting the freezing of eggs, I had so many people reach out going, oh, I've had this in the back of my mind. Um, Thank you for sharing. You've just made this a bit easier. Can you imagine... If we just had these conversations with our friends normally, yes. or not even friends, acquaintances at work. So naturally, again, I am a really authentic leader. I'm not a, I'm not an oversharer, but still will raise this with my team and mm. say this is possible. Mm. You know, you don't need to worry about these pressures. You do what feels right for you. So I think that education piece between each other, it yeah. means – You know, we've got someone to turn to if we ever need to have a chat about something. Yes. Um, But, yeah, no, even the geriatric pregnancy, I think it it could be from 34. It's terrible. when I was there, I had a moment, you know, had a few tears, been like, oh, my God, what have I done? You know, is everything going to be fine? Mm. And then got over it because I've got time. Everyone has time. Um, And... Yeah, going into the doctors and then then saying you need to start trying for kids right now. Can you imagine, again, a moment um, and people, you've got that from the doctor. You don't need that from everyone else. You need everyone to go, it's okay, here's some measures that you can take to give yourself a bit more time yes. till you're ready. Yes. Because not everyone is ready when the doctor says, go start making babies. No. No, just not. Financially, emotionally, in their careers, in their relationships. No. Yeah. So much pressure. Too much pressure. Too much. And it is, I say this in my um, posts about this, it's actually the emotional journey when you're freezing eggs rather than the actual, like obviously, I'm sorry for people who don't like needles. There's some needles. I have a needle phobia and I still figured it out. Yeah. Um, And it wasn't that bad, but it was actually the emotional journey going through that feeling like, have I failed myself Um, because I haven't had kids yet? Why am I doing this? And it's, I, at one point when I was, my first needle, I had to give myself a pep talk and go, I'm doing this so that I can have the life that I want to have and haven't failed myself. I'm just giving myself a little bit of extra time and security and peace of mind that, you know, when it is time, I can go and use those eggs if I if I need to use them, because uh, it's more of a backup for yes. me. And life goes on. I, yeah, but pep talk was required. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, do you, um? I don't know if you know Shelley Horton. She's a presenter and yep. MC, and I follow along her journey. Um, her, just her full stop, and. I so often see her post around, I have chosen not to have children. Now, this is a different conversation for your life in this moment. But she says, you know, I've chosen not to have children. But the amount of people, and it just blows my mind, why haven't you had kids or what happened? She says, I've chosen. (laughs) It's a (laughs) choice. But it's like... It's like we're telling people like we've got leprosy yeah. or like there's something really wrong with us that yeah. society have just got such strong expectations and yeah, I think life is – there's enough challenge in life then we don't need to be putting our own maps of the world on everyone else. So, yeah. yeah fully honest, I agree with that. I've got a lot of friends that are choosing not to have children or they're in the mindset that if it happens, it happens and great. Mm. And I – just cannot believe the amount of people that are like are you sure are you sure that's what you want it's like yeah they get to go on unlimited holidays <laughs> they get to like live their best life they can do whatever they want whenever they want um yeah hello <laughs> It's a choice, yeah. yeah. And it, I think it's the empowerment, right? It's now it's shifting that to not what everyone expects of us, empowered to make our own choices for our own lives. Yeah. Hallelujah to that, I think, whatever that whatever that path is. And I love that you're, okay, well, when I'm ready, when that time is, it's it's a, um, a safety net and yeah. see if you need it. And, yeah, yeah, bravo. And what I really love is hearing around the amount of people who then reached out to you mm. and said thank you for sharing that and what it gave them. And to me that's the – That's the positive power of social media and when we have the courage to share and the courage to actually show behind the curtain or whatever, the real, real, um, where people go, all right, this is the human element of life and, yeah, that's so inspiring and no doubt will have made an impact on so many people. Yeah. So powerful. Yeah. Bravo to you. It's so good. 
Ellen, um, as we come to a close, I would love to know what's on the horizon right now because you've had some exciting launches with the Somewhere Co. What's on the horizon for products and the brand at the moment? Well, yes, we've just launched fashion. So that was a big undertaking and we have actually launched another brand with it. So that's that's been a big deal. And then we've got so much new coming. It is just nonstop landing between now and January. Uh, the business is really ramped up. We've gone through a lot of evolution this year uh, and we're just now starting to see all our hard work come to fruition, I'd say, over the next six months. But definitely a lot of product product category expansion but international expansion and our team as well has been changing too so I don't know I feel like it's quite an exciting time yeah that's amazing we're we're almost at the top of that roller coaster yeah we're definitely up 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 um for those who are interested to see the fashion and the different uh links we'll put all the notes in the show notes as well um I did see a beautiful or hear a beautiful story on social media about maybe a customer, someone in the community saying when they saw you guys and the colour and how it made them feel. Can you share that story? Because I think that's really powerful. So we had – this is how we came to say yes to fashion. So I've had Kate in my ear for so long being like, we need to make our own dresses. And I've gone, no, no, it's not in alignment with the brand um, at this stage. And we dabbled in PJs, we dabbled in some raincoats. So it's not like we weren't in looking at fashion in some sense. Mm -hmm. And one day Kate and I were in these really beautiful, colourful dresses and had a lady like fully get in front of our path, stop us, who were just getting lunch, and say, you have just, can I just say, you have brightened my day with your so much colour and just brought so much joy to me. And literally we walked away from that and I went, fine, it's time. It's time for us to bring our own fashion out. It, it really aligns with what, we're, we are, what we stand for and living boldly and authentically. And we want to create this community where people feel safe and um, you can sit with us. So, yeah, that's how fashion was a big yes. That is so exciting. You've got to go and check this out. Um, Yes, we'll put all the show notes and I'm excited to get my first new dress very soon. I'm very (laughs) excited. I'm all for the colour. I think living boldly and bringing that brightness to life is, it's just joy. And the world, in my opinion, the world needs more joy. We need more opportunities to spark more joy. And this is one of them, the fashion. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. My last question for you, Ellen, you know, we start by asking what does lead with courage mean to you? But I'd love to know a little bit of a, about a leadership tip. So if there's one leadership tip that you would leave our listeners with today, what would that be? We've spoken about it a lot mm-hmm. in our chat today and it's leading with empathy. I think that's such an underrated uh, skill. Mm. Is it a skill? It is a skill. Yes. Yes. That... that People need to flex. If they don't have it, I think they definitely need to flex up. It's so crucial understanding another human being, Mm. their why, um, because it's not the same as the person next to them. Mm. So when you can understand someone or what might be going on for someone, you are able to help them um, a little bit more on the way. So if your team members or, you know, family, whoever it might be, are happy and thriving – your business is thriving. Yes. So I think empathy goes a long way and asking questions rather than assumptions with a lot of things. So I think that's my number one tip. I fully wholeheartedly agree. And literally this week I was running a few workshops where empathy was part of it. And it, it is a skill. And I think for some people it's not an innate natural way of leading so it's something they can develop. Can I just ask, uh, you know, next step question on that is, when you've got the values of move the needle and you're here to build a sustainable, profitable, great business and leading with empathy, understanding what's going on, what tips do you have there? Because I feel that for some people they might not want to get into the weeds of what's going on for people in their lives because it might be seen as a distraction from achieving the goals. Yes. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? That's definitely a balance. Um, I think – you know, and we've, don't get me wrong, we've obviously also gone through challenges with people are complex beings. Yes, and they are. It's not this perfect world where, you know, everything is wonderful and, you know, we're all making um, profits and building the business or whatever it might be. It goes two ways. It's also crucial, I think, when, um, yes, you're having empathy for others, but 
you also need that in return. The business also needs that in return. Yes. So I think that's more at the core and um, it obviously depends what is going on. But sometimes it might be time for someone to move on because, mm. you know, you are having these empathetic conversations and it's maybe not changing or it's time for someone to fly their wings. No one stays with you. for Well, Kay has stayed with me. Um, <laughs> one day will be her time. And so I think it's still important to have your KPIs and where you want the business to go and what the expectations of the business are. But it doesn't take away of asking these very simple questions or in performance reviews, really finding out what might be going on for them. It, but it does not mean people pleasing. I think yes. empathy and people pleasing are not the same thing. Um, so there's boundaries all w- wrapped up within that. I am loving that. I absolutely love that because, yeah, that's the takeaway. I think that's where people, even myself over the years, I can get, I can blend in the people pleasing and really mix it up with empathy. But there's that Brene Brown quote, unclear is unkind and clear is kind. And so that doesn't mean to be a pushover, yes. just be nice about everything, but clear boundaries, kindness, empathy and goals and expectations. Yes, yeah. so good. That is just the most perfect way to end. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a delight. I'm so excited that I'm your first podcast <laughs> on the Lead of Courage podcast. We're very, very lucky, but thank you for your time, your honesty, and cannot wait to see more of the beautiful, bold colours out in the world. Uh, thank you so much, Helen. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us on the Lead with Courage podcast. We illuminate leadership and it's our mission to inspire and grow the leaders of today to create a better tomorrow. We hope and trust that this episode has given you some insights and joy to empower you to live your biggest, best life. If you did enjoy the episode, we'd be so grateful for you to rate and share wherever you listen to this podcast. And until next time, go and lead with courage.